Hey, so this is uh, F5 uh, going uh, through food chemistry, and F5 is looking at genetically modified foods here. And so our definition of what a genetically modified food, and occasionally, let's see, called GMOs, um, a genetically modified food is one that's derived or produced from a genetically modified organism. And uh, maybe you're with me that I don't really like definitions that are based, uh, that define the word using the same word. Uh, what's a genetically modified food? Well, it's genetically modified. Um, that seems kind of like a cop-out, but this is the uh, definition that's from the, the IB standards here. So it says the food can be different or the same. Again, not giving us a lot of information. It can be substantially different or essentially the same as the conventional food. Um, in terms of composition, taste, uh, smell, texture, and all of those things. Okay, so now finally, if we start looking down here, now we're starting to look at um, maybe a little bit uh, better explanation of what genetically modified now organisms are. So the genetically modified food is derived from the organism. So the organism is genetically modified. When you grow that modified organism, it um, when you grow it and produce it for food, then it becomes food. So there are specific changes introduced into the DNA. Okay, specific changes introduced into the DNA of the organism. And, and before we jump up and down and say, "Hey, don't don't modify my organisms; they're natural," um, you have to think that people really have been modifying food organisms since uh, the beginning of farming. The way farming has started is through selective breeding, plant breeding, animal breeding. Um, it, if there wasn't selective breeding uh, of, of plants and of animals, there, there wouldn't be any type of agricultural um, substances at all. The first wheats were taken from, you know, wheats that, that grew big enough seeds that they could actually be harvested. Harvesting those, those were replanted, you know, grew... Um, plants with the e even bigger seeds that were even more likely to be harvested. And so uh, the m modification of the environment and the modification of the breeding of the plants and animals has, has always occurred uh, since humans started interacting with them. Um, in a lot of ways, I guess people think that genetically modified foods is one step beyond that because now we're actually going into the DNA of the molecule, and they might be right. Um, but uh, I suppose let's, let's go on and talk about some maybe a little bit more specifics before, before we start start this argument. Okay, so just a little bit of history on genetically modified foods. And again, foods have been altered since the beginning of food. There would not be farming. Um, there would not be domesticated animals uh, if they weren't domesticated, if there wasn't that natural, well, I, I don't want to say natural selection, that uh, maybe interaction between humans and their environment um, and selective breeding. But genetically modified foods, again, I mean, it is different. Um, in some ways, it's something that people have always done, trying to alter their environment to their best uh, so that it works the best for them. But obviously, genetically modified foods are a little bit different. So uh, it involves the insertion or the deletion of genes within the DNA. Um, these foods were first put on the market in um, 1996. So these have a very, uh, very, really short time frame as far as what, uh, how long people have been experienced to them. Um, First one that was genetically grown and modified and sold as a commercial product was a tomato called a flavor saver. Um, so it was supposed to ripen um, with, without getting soft. So you know if you have an old tomato, it gets kind of kind of soft over time. So it was supposed to ripen but have a nice uh, kind of hard skin. Um, it, and it was originally developed by this company called Calgeen, then later uh, purchased by Monsanto, which you're going to hear over and over again when we talk about genetically modified foods. Um, that crop actually was not, uh, it wasn't very popular. Uh, they had to take it off the market. Um, people just, it, it was genetically modified, it was supposed to be better, but uh, people ended up not really liking it. It was kind of a, it's kind of a, a commercial flop. Um, however, now it says about 10% of the world's croplands are planted with GM crops in 2010, I'm, you know, I'm sure that's uh, even higher now. And what we, you know, it's not the foods that we might think are modified, you know, like the tomatoes and like the fruit. I mean, those are the ones that, that people catch on and, and are aware of in media, but really genetically modified soybeans, corn, canola oil, really the, the staple um, grains that people eat, the staple cereals, are the ones that really are our highest um, in, in the rates of genetically modified organisms. Um, 
So what types of modifications are they doing to these? Well, the soybeans, um, and actually with a lot of these, what they're doing is they're um, putting in herb-resistant genes into the soybeans. Um, so it's, a, it's Monsanto's Roundup type of program. So they put in a herbicide-resistant gene into the plant, and then they can spray the whole crops with... Um, a little bit uh, stronger herbicides to, again, to kill any of the weeds that might grow in, and again, the plants themselves aren't affected. So that is really the, the major types of modifications that are going on, is just to, to allow certain pesticides and herbicides to be sprayed over the whole croplands and not actually harm the crops. Um, other ones, um, there's some other th different things that are added, but that, that's probably the majority is... Uh, is Monsanto putting uh, herbicide-resistant genes in crops like soybeans and, and in others as well. Okay, so what are, why would you do this? What are the benefits? Um, well, what they have found, actually, is there's actually quite a few benefits to genetically modified foods. Um, this is the U.S. Naval Academy reported that genetically modified crops resulted in reduced pesticide application and reduced soil erosion from tilling. So, here, here's the catch of it, is if you put this herbicide in the plant... Um, so that the plant is resistant to that herbicide, well, then you might not have to spray as much of that herbicide or pesticide over the land um, because you don't might not have to coat the uh, the farm fields quite as often. And also, again, if there's less weeds because the uh, herbicide or pesticide is more, uh, again, a pesticide is going to go after a pest, a herbicide is going to go after weeds. It, if it's more effective, then there doesn't have to be as much tilling and pulling of the weeds and and, uh, and turning the soil over between the times when it's grown. So, um, really, and also going on here, if we look at this is from the European uh, Commission Directorate, um, it's found that that GMOs really in this study did a bunch of different uh, over 25 years of research, bunch of different research projects that GMOs not are not necessarily more risky than conventional plants. So they're really unpopular in a certain group uh, of people, but not necessarily more risky. They really haven't found evidence of them being more risky. Um, some things, other things that they can do is uh, genetically modify foods for the better taste, um, reduced maturation time. So what happens if you have reduced maturation times? You can just grow more food uh, faster. Um, a big one, actually, that was just in the news not too long ago is the enrichment of rice with vitamin A. And so there's um, some vitamin A deficiencies in part of the world, and one thing that uh, I believe it was Monsanto, again, that was working on was putting vitamin A into the rice so that the rice w would have that in in right in it, and so people who ate it could get those vitamins. And, and there's people who tried to prevent them from doing that, but at the same time, you have to remember that not everybody lives in the first world. <laughs> not everybody has plenty of vitamin A. Not everybody has multivitamins that they can take, you know, before they go for their jog and they come back home and they have their protein shake. I mean, the majority of the world doesn't function that way. The majority of the world is actually, um, e actually, you know, is striving to get enough quality nutrients into their diet. Um, and so genetically modified foods is one day, way to do that. In animals, they can get better yields, um, improved animal health, improved resistance to, um, and to germs, to bacteria. Um, and, and notice if we're using herbicides and insecticides, uh, you know, if, and if they're using them right in those genetically modified organisms, well, that means they're, perhaps if they're more drought resistant, you don't have to use as much water on the cropland or you don't necessarily have to use as much pesticide or herbicide. So there are a lot of benefits. Okay, that's the benefit side. So we're not done. So before you get too angry with me, we're not done. We're just talking about the benefits, right? Now. Obviously, there's also concerns with genetically modified organisms. Um, people are concerned of uh, safety issues, but also economic concerns and, and really intellectual property law. And this is the one that I guess I think is a bigger deal, um, are the economic concerns and the intellectual property. I think a lot of people are concerned about the health risks, and really there's not, there's not a lot of um, data to back that up, that there is health concerns with genetically modified foods. Um, but what is interesting is what happens to economic concerns and intellectual property law. So um, one study at the University of Arkansas in the United States showed that 
83% of wild canola um, seeds tested positive for some, some herbicide-resistant genes. So those GMO crops, when they are grown over here, some of their seeds crossed into the plantation, you know, across the road, and then those got some strains of the genetically modified foods. Now, here's the question that that's some of the that is coming up is that if one person is growing their genetically modified uh, soybeans here and the other person across the road is not but again you can't stop the wind from blowing and the seeds from migrating and these seeds across the street start um, growing a little bit better because they have those genetically modified organisms in them now now my little check marks are genetically modified organisms now do they owe money to their neighbor across the street? Do they owe money to Monsanto because they have genes in it that have been designed by Monsanto? And actually, this is this is the big thing that is in um, court cases right now in the United States. Um, so Monsanto it easily is the leader of GMO um, seed manufacturing in the United States, probably uh, actually in the world. Um, and they say that Monsanto uh, manipulates the seed market. And how they do that is a lot of these seeds that they manufacture, they, they manufacture them so that they don't, um, so that they don't reproduce. Or that, so farmers will have to buy the license for the seeds every single year. So the whole history of farming is farmers, traditional farmers, harvested their seeds, part of their seeds from their crops so they could grow their next year's crop. Well, what Monsanto is arguing is that those seeds belong to them because they're, they're, modified organisms, they're their intellectual property, so that you cannot harvest seeds from Monsanto crops and, and re-sow them because those belong to Monsanto because they've modified the genes. So every time you plant Monsanto um, soybeans, you have to pay a licensing fee to, uh, to Monsanto. There is a court case right now in the United States where a farmer would plant Monsanto and he paid the licensing fees to plant uh, Monsanto, uh, I believe it's soybeans, but he did two crops. Or actually, I believe it was wheat. He had a he had a winter wheat and a summer wheat. And during one of those seasons, he planted Monsanto. And during the other season, he planted just normal, regular, cheaper seeds that you can buy off the shelf. Well, since he was uh, interchanging them, his regular seeds started growing better and better because they did get some of those genetically modified organisms switched over. And you know, some crops were left in the ground, um, and and they ended up growing in and not that he tried to, they just kind of naturally did. Genes naturally spread, that's what plants do. Um, but then Monsanto uh, went after him and started suing him because he w there was traces of their intellectual property rights in his wheat that he wasn't buying from Monsanto. And they were arguing that he was doing this maliciously. Um, um, and he obviously argues that he's not. Um, they argue that he has to pay if there's any genetically modified organisms in his crop. Um, and he obviously is arguing not, so it's kind of an issue. There's another interesting court case, a recent court case um, from Canada, is that uh, a Canadian farmer who never planted Monsanto seeds, uh, it was found that they had uh, the Roundup Ready gene, that uh, herbicide gene, in his crops, um, and it there wasn't any determination that whether it was um, natural gene flow across fields or intentional theft, um, but the overwhelming evidence of the case, um, they tried to lead to believe that this farmer intentionally selected for it. So he never bought the crops, but it showed up in his field, and once that um, trait showed up in his field, then he in intentionally selected some seeds from those plants to replant. Um, and so, um, notice uh, he saved seeds from those areas where he saw it that were adjacent to where there were Roundup Ready seeds, so there would be some uh, gene drift over into his field. He would save those seeds that were by the edges of those fields where those genes crossed over, and those were the seeds that he replanted. Um, and so, what they charged, they charged that he, he used, knowingly used um, their genes 
in his plans and that they owed, owed him royalties. And the interesting thing is that the Canadian Supreme Court um, ruled in Monsanto's favor. They ruled in his favor that even though he never bought their or never bought their seeds, he didn't go in and steal seeds from them. Um, their genes crossed over to his field, but because he self he selected those genes. Those, the genes that were in those plants were Monsanto's property. It's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting um, type of court case. And there, there's multiples of these going on right now about who really owns the food and the seeds from that food once that food has been genetically altered. Um, it's really interesting. Um, I, I think much more interesting than just uh, claims about health concerns. And maybe there's health concerns as well. But I think more than health concerns, there's definitely these intellectual property concerns and definitely economic concerns for, for farmers and traditional farming. Um, as genetically modified foods kind of move across the earth and become more uh, predominant, I mean, will, will farmers at all be able to own their seeds and harvest seeds from their own crops? Or will all seeds belong to Monsanto, no matter what? I mean, it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, situation that we're in, we're all in as a world. But uh, So that's genetically modified organisms and some benefits and some concerns about using GM foods.